Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our monthly journal club of Young Ifso. And uh, today we are going to discuss very interesting papers. And our webinar will be directed by uh, Dr. Diana Gabriela Maldonado Pintado, uh, my friend from Mexico. And she's a, a robotic and bariatric surgeon, a pioneer of bariatric surgery, one of the pioneers of young surgeons in bariatric surgery in Mexico and she's going to direct uh, our symposium today and we have uh, distinguished panelists and also a uh, very distinguished faculty who are going to present new concepts. Uh, hello Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you for preparing such a uh, good meeting with uh, all these quality discussions. I think it will be a very nice webinar of Latin American chapter of uh, Young Ipso Journal Club. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. It's my pleasure. And I will introduce this uh, webinar. Um, well, on behalf of the fourth Ipso Young webinar by Latin America, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this academical activity for many surgeons from many countries and continents, of course. I have the honor to have been included by Erin as director of Ipso Young LAC, uh, and, and I am very happy to be coordinating this monthly webinar, including at this time some of my colleagues from Mexico, Latin America, and Spain. As you know, this is an international activity, so for sure uh, the official language will be in English, but it's nice to know that many of us are united by the Spanish language and the, and the Hispanic culture. We have two moderators during all the webinar. One is from Chile, my good friend and very active surgeon Marcos Berry, who had been done uh, some research about bariatric surgery in low BMI. And also from Spain, we have a great person, Dr. Ramon Villalonga, who I will, uh, who I know him since many years um, for his wonderful work in robotics, studies, and all kinds of procedures in bariatric surgery. Both of them are wonderful personalities to be here with us and Thank you very much. For the first fun part of the webinar, we will have a keynote lecture, by, uh, which will be done by Dr. Guillermo Ponce de Leon. He's from Mexico, talking about the IFSO consensus of studies. And also we will have a paper discussion by the format of uh, these webinars about metabolic surgery in low BMI, which will be presented by his author, Dr. Carlos Cervec from Mexico. At the end, we will have a discussion with our panelists about these wonderful and innovative topics. So uh, I hope all of you enjoy a lot these discussions and thank you very much to all of you to accepting taking part at this webinar today. Before anything, I would like uh, to, to thanks also to IFSO and special thanks to Manuela Mazzarella, the IFSO Secretariat, who helped with all the minimal details, details for this um, webinar, uh, which is doing these uh, minimal details, doing a very big event. Uh, thanks to Erin to invite me to coordinate this webinar. And uh, then uh, if you, Marcos Berry, and Dr. Ramon Villalonga as moderators can start to present the other panelists, please. Marcos, do you want to <clears throat> go on? Can you, Can you serve? Because I, I do not have it right with me the the CVs. Well, I think uh, what we we can uh, start doing, I, I would suggest, uh, according to the plans, Diana, would be to start with the uh, with the lectures. Uh, then sure. we will we will uh, stop our uh, cameras and and micros. And after the pre-recorded lectures, we will, Marcos and myself, get uh, some questions for the uh, panelists. And, and I think that's going to be a great opportunity to introduce each other. And maybe also we can uh, maybe uh, feel free to, to comment. I think there's a, a, a work to do as a moderators for, the, for taking uh, 
part of uh, the the questions. Our questions will be transferred by, as you mentioned, uh, Manuela, who is uh, taking care of us now uh, through our uh, uh, WhatsApp group in order to get questions. But uh, uh, Marcos and myself will be very uh, uh, clear in checking all the questions, and maybe we can configure some questions, specific questions that will come from the open chat for the participants. I think uh, now we are almost, uh, we were more than 170 uh, persons registered. I think now we are around 40 persons connected, which is something which I uh, suspect is going to be increasing, uh, but I'm sure we, we're going to spend a, a great time. Uh, Marcos is a, a co-chair with me and moderator, and I don't know if you want to comment something, Marcos, uh, according to the plan. No, I agree, and uh, we are open to to welcome all your questions, and we are going to filter them and ask the the presenters and also the panelists. But uh, before we start, we are going to uh, start with our first poll, uh, Manuela. Uh, okay, the poll says, what is the optimal length of the common channel in SEBI S01 osmosis duodenal switch? 200 centimeters, 250, 300, or larger than 300? If you can answer, please. Okay, so the results show that the majority of the audience of, uh, think that 250 is the optimal length, 46%, and followed by 200 and 300, 23% each, and more than 300, only 8%. So most of uh, the respondents believe that 250 is the optimal length. Thank you. I think this uh, question will give us a, a great debate uh, after the, the the keynote lecture, and I hope uh, the the information that is going to be given will help us to elucidate uh, some of the aspects of uh, doing studies at two meters or more than three meters. I think uh, if we can do the pool at the end, maybe some opinions might change. So, thank you very much for for everything, uh, and I think we can go ahead with the first presentation. Hello, good morning, Latin America. Good afternoon and good evening to the rest of the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Maldonado, for this kindly invitation. I really appreciate this. <coughs> Today, I'm going to discuss a single anastomosis to the ileal bypass with a sleep gastrectomy, one anastomosis to the now switch, study as the if supposition statement, the update of the 2020. The members of the IFSO task force who participated in this update were the following. Professors Geraldine Oy, Wendy Brown, and Lillian Kaut, actual president of the IFSO from Australia. Professor Antonio Torres from Spain. Professor Jack Hintons from Belgium. Professors Scott Chicora and Calvin Higa from the United States. And Professor Miguel Herrera from Mexico. Uh, we all know that SADIS was proposed as a modification of the bilipercratic diversion with the switch. But uh, as an introduction, we must know that originally during the 70s, uh, Professor Scott Pinaro described the bilipercratic diversion. This procedure consisted in an horizontal gastrectomy and a rooks and wide configuration, which consisted in a alimentary limb length of 250 centimeters and a common channel of 50 centimeters. However, this procedure used to be related to many long-term complications, such as malnutrition, uh, high number of marginal ulcers, and many other deficiencies. <clears throat> On the other hand, in 1987, the minister proposed a pilot respiring procedure as an alternative to the conventional Brooks and White gas bypass, this with the intention to decrease the risk of biliary reflux. 
And therefore, in 1989, Hess and Marceau published for the first time the bibliopocratic version with Gouvernail Switch, the BPDDS as we know it nowadays. The procedure consisted of a vertical uh, gastrectomy a slip uh, with a Gouvernail Switch. Uh, they made a cut uh, following the <clears throat> pylorus two centimeters they, with the intention to preserve the pylorus. Um, and also this procedure, um, the configuration of the, uh, the small ball will include a root and Y and which they left a common channel of at least 100 centimeters. The intention of the gastric antrum and pylorus preservation were to avoid marginal ulcers and that used to occur quite frequently after the original billion pancreatic diversion. Both uh, BPD and BPDDS have shown to provide greater weight loss than many other bariatric procedures uh, <clears throat> with a concurrent sustained improvement in metabolic health. However, as I mentioned before, uh, these procedures are related to a greater risk for deficiencies. And also it is important to highlight that these procedures are technically complex. For this reason, in 2007, Sanchez Pernaut and Torres proposed the sad yes. <clears throat> this as an alternative to the bilipancratic diversion with total switch. They hypothesized that uh, the procedure with just one anastomosis would be related to a lower risk of complications, lower operative time, and would have a similar effect in terms of metabolic control and weight loss. The study is consists in a wide sleeve gastrectomy. They recommend to use a gastric calibration tube greater than 50 French, specifically 54 French. And initially they described this procedure with a common channel of 200 centimeters. However, <clears throat> they found that up to 8% of the patients develop malnutrition. Therefore, they decided to modify the length of the common channel to a minimum of 250 centimeters. Many other authors uh, like Cotton in the United States have described different procedures uh, such as SIPs, uh, in which they recommend to left a common channel of at least 300 centimeters, this with intention to avoid malnutrition and deficiencies. In 2018, the IPSO released the first position statement uh, regarding SADIS. This statement paper noted the need for more evidence and some of the conclusions were that SADIS is a safe and an effective procedure for the treatment of obesity. Also, they noted that there is not enough medical evidence that supports the superiority of the standard pancreatic diversion with dodenal switch, neither for the SADES. That many nutritional issues will take years to present and the lack of data regarding safety and efficacy at long term. And also, they encourage us for the creation of randomized controlled trials in the future. Despite all of these, the IFSO recognized the SADES as a bariatric and metabolic procedure. Also, it is important to mention that in the 2016, the ACMBS considered SADES just as an investigational procedure. This due to the lack of enough randomized or prospective data to draw relevant conclusions regarding the safety and efficacy. But in the 2020, the ASMBS endorsed the SADES as an appropriate metabolic procedure. However, they highlighted that a lack of evidence regarding intestinal adaptation, nutritional issues, the optimal limb lengths, and long-term weight loss or weight regain regarding SADES, okay? For this reason, they recommended a cautious approach to the adoption of this procedure. All the IPSA position statements consider some aspects, including safety, efficacy, long-term consequences, and are valid just for two years. Regarding safety, it, they evaluate that is the procedure or modification of an existing procedure as safe or safer than existing procedures, 
regarding efficacy is the procedure or modification of an existing procedure as effective or more effective than existing procedure. They evaluate long-term consequences. And as I mentioned, uh, these positions papers, sustaining papers as a two-year expiration, at which time the current level of evidence will be reevaluated and the position statement will be reaffirmed, updated, or modified. For this reason, we conducted a new systematic review. Uh, this was carried out in Medline, Embase, PubMed, and Cochrane Center libraries. The collected data included year of publication of the paper, country, a study design, sample size, demographic data, surgical technique, in this including the limb lengths, the follow-up, weight loss parameters, evolution of type 2 diabetes, and complications. A total of 161 articles were assessed for eligibility and 50 studies were included, from which 42 are cases serious and eight are case reports. A total of 25 case series and three case reports were added to the latest position statement. The risk of bias of each study was assessed by two investigators using the Newcastle Ottawa scale for cohort and case control studies. Just one study had a low risk of bias, whereas the remaining had a moderate risk of bias. Uh, regarding the outcomes, uh, we will discuss first primary or um, <clears throat> first intention SADES procedures. And by the beginning, we will start with weight loss. Uh, the sample size of primary SADES was uh, 4,540 patients. Uh, this is overestimated because many of these patients were included in many of the different papers included in this revision. We found that the mean total weight loss at 12 months ranged between 23% and 39%. At two years, this was uh, again close to the 23%, up to 47.8%. The mean excess of weight loss at short term ranges between 62% to 102%. <clears throat> Three series included data at five years. The follow-up of this series ranges between 73% and 100% follow-up. And the main total weight loss at five years in this series ranges between 22 up to 38%. Just one Montecentric study included data up after five years, and these were uh, six years, and total weight loss or mean total weight loss was 38%. In terms of type 2 diabetes, uh, changes in type 2 diabetes diagnosis and treatment was reported in 28 cases series. And there was significant improvement in both HbA1c and requirement for hypoglycemic agents. Uh, regarding partial or complete remission rates, at one year we found that 50 to 100 percent of the patients showed uh, partial or complete remission. At midterm, these were between 57 to 100 percent, and at long term, five years. Each ranged between 52% to 100%. So these are good to excellent results regarding type 2 diabetes control. Uh, <clears throat> regarding complications following primary SADES, we found that early complications included anastomotic leak, bleeding, and nausea. Also, longer term complications included cord by reflux, dumping syndrome, and many nutritional issues. The nutritional issues reported included malnutrition, hypoglycemia, vitamin D deficiency, hypocalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, and iron deficiency. 
Probably iron deficiency was the most common one. Revisional procedures for these issues have been described. Many of the case reports included in this revision were related to this topic. Some of these complications included at least 12 severe malnutrition. Many of these patients underwent a revisional surgery. One patient who developed liver cirrhosis following SADES. 33 cases of mild to severe chronic diarrhea. And <clears throat> regarding abnormal albuminin, this ranged between 5% to 6.7%. These were just reported in two series. And up to 50% of a normal calcium or vitamin D. And as I was mentioned before, the most common one was iron deficiency, which ranged between 23% to 100%. And in terms of results of revision SADES or secondary SADES, uh, we found that the weight loss achieved appears to be similar to primary patients. One report included data of five years. However, the majority of the reports were limited to two-year follow-up. The effect of type 2 diabetes appears similar to the primary procedures. Partial or complete remission rates were achieved between 71% to 100% of the patients. In terms of complications, early complications were uncommon in all serious. This is important to highlight. And some of the included uh, were anastomotic leaks, bleeding, and nausea, similar to primary SADES procedures. Late complications also included similar complications real, uh, that, as I mentioned, in primary SADES. And these were some reports of hypovolemia iron deficiency, GERD, zombie syndrome, flatulence were also reported. In terms of the results uh, of weight loss uh, of secondary SADES or revision SADES, uh, we found uh, the sample size was 347 patients. Again, this was overestimated because many of the patients were also included in many other different uh, studies. The mean total weight loss at 12 months ranged between 10 to 25%. And at two years, these were close to 20% up to 26%. Mean excess of weight loss ranged between 57% to 70% at 12 months. And at two years, this was uh, between 44 and 81 percent, again showing good to excellent results regarding weight loss. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned before, but partial or complete remission rates of type 2 diabetes ranges between 71 to 100 percent. Again, excellent results in metabolic control. Some of the recommendations of the ifso sadies tax force uh, following this paper are the following. First, SADES or one anastomosis or anal switch offers substantial weight loss that it is maintained into medium term. These data were um, unavailable at the first position statement. Second, SADES or one anastomosis or anal switch provides an improvement in metabolic health that is maintained into medium term. Three, nutritional deficiencies are emerging and patients undergoing this procedure need to be aware of this and consult to stay in long-term multidisciplinary care. Four, bariatric surgeons are encouraged to participate in a national or international registry so that data may be more effectively Identify and fifth, uh, the IFSO supports SADES or one anastomosis studenal switch as a recognized bariatric and metabolic procedure, but highly encourages for the creation of randomized controlled trials in the near future.
Again, I, want re I really want to thank Dr. Maldonado and Professor Miguel Herrera for this participated, uh, for this participation. And I don't know if you have any question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank thank you very you. much. We are back to the to the stage. Uh, Guillermo, thank you very much for uh, this very update in uh, what has been, I would say, the history of uh, a procedure that comes from uh, other origins, uh, but that have we have had the privilege to have uh, its founders here in in Spain in an Hospital Clinico and its diversities and maybe competing a little bit with uh, with the SIPs. I would like to 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 ask you, uh, Guillermo, and then we'll get, we'll start uh, sharing with you. Uh, the questions with the panelists. Uh, uh, you, in your uh, standard bariatric uh, practice in, in Mexico, do, in which cases do you consider SADI as a primary procedure or as, as a revisional procedure? In my practice, I only consider SADI S or these procedures related to pilorospirin procedures just in supervised patients. Uh, I think that these uh, procedures are kind of aggressive metabolic procedures and also carries uh, an important weight loss. So for that reason, I only offer these for supervised patients. And also, I think that in Mexico, we don't have the, a rich protein diet. So I think that the selection of patients who will undergo to these procedures will be very specifically. So I think that that is an important thing to mention. And also, I think that it's a very good option as a revisional procedure. As I was mentioning in the, uh, during the presentation, SADIS uh, can give us our, an important weight loss and an important metabolic control as a revisional procedure. So I think that it's a good option for patients who fail specifically the sleep gastrectomy okay i would like to to, to share uh, any questions from the the panelists maybe if they want to give some uh, uh, own experience i i see uh, mustafa from uh, the, the the clinic in bariatric surgery in frankfurt or maybe uh, karine both very prominent bariatric surgeons karine from uh, prague you want to give some comments if you have experience in sadi or the reasons why you thought you would say that uh, we have to be very careful in in, in, in the indications and uh, the results of this procedure. Uh, Mustafa, maybe? And then... Uh, just uh, turn on the audio. Yes. Now, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for the nice uh, presentation. Um, uh, we are we are doing SADI very very rarely um, in in Germany uh, uh, generally, and because we are doing a lot of uh, SADI as uh, in the revisional surgery. But uh, SADI is very very um, uh, we are very conservative us uh, um, in, uh, for SADI because of the complication and the high risk. We are um, um, dealing here with uh, high BME patients. And then most of uh, of redos we are trying to tend yeah, to to SASI. Uh, so I can't I can't tell you a lot of experience in in SADI operation in Germany. I think it's uh, everywhere in Germany is more uh, tending now uh, um, in the direction of of SASI to avoid the risk of complications regarding the the SADI operation. And it's still in in Germany it's not registered and uh, in our standards operations. So we are very uh, conservative with doing such uh, such procedures. Okay. It's still experimental. Okay. okay, thank you. Karim, can you give you the, your idea what is going on with SADI in, uh, in uh, Czech Republic? Uh, we are in the same situation as uh, in uh, German because it's uh, not uh, uh, covered by insurance and uh, it's not allowed to uh, provide uh, this kind of uh, operation. Uh, uh, as a bariatric procedure. Uh, in fact, uh, we prefer uh, to do, uh, as a redo procedure, we prefer to do scopinaro, uh, normal scopinaro procedure, uh, 
so but sadly maybe the future uh will show that uh, it's a good procedure but i think we need a uh, longer follow-up of these patients maybe i can give an um, introduction of sadly because i'm from the team of professor praga in vienna um, and we are doing now a sadly as procedure since about um, five years and it's now our main procedure for all patients with a BMI of 50 and more. And um, our experience is really very good. So I think we, it's a very promising procedure. So for, for our technique, we are normally us using a little bit um, larger bougie than in, in normal sleeves. So we use, we use um, 16 millimeter bougie. And um, we are always try to be on the safe side um doing a common limb length of 300 centimeter and so far we haven't seen any patient with malnutrition and um yeah but it's it's a um, little bit more experience operation than um for example a ruined digestive bypass or one osteomosis because of this hand sewn anastomosis that needs some time and we are doing double layer um posterior wall, so um, this is a uh, yeah, very experienced for a surgeon. So we have only two um, centers in Austria that are doing this procedure, but so far our experience is really very good. Good weight loss, good remission rates of, um, of diabetes. So one of our um, young residents right now um, collecting the data and um, he will present it at the next um, IFSOEC chapter. But yeah, I think it's a very promising procedure. Okay. Maybe can I say something? Uh, maybe I, can I share a bit? So I'm mm -hmm. Renu from Malaysia and um, being in a Southeast Asian yeah. countries, um, we see predominantly iron deficiency and vitamin D deficiency in our population. So uh, uh, I would say a good 50 to 70% of our cases that come in for bariatric surgery, when we do the pre-operative investigation, we're seeing 50 to 70 percent of iron deficiency, ranging from extremely low requiring IV venofer to just tablet supplementation. So it's already a pre-existing issue in Southeast Asia, at least in Malaysia. I can't speak for the rest of the countries. Um, also, the other alarming micronutrient deficiency that we see in Malaysia is vitamin D. You would think that it's a tropical country and everybody gets a lot of sun, but people in hot sunny countries usually run from their home to the car, car to the office. Not many people are running outside in that hot sun. You know, we avoid the sun rather than, um, you know, sunbathing is not a part of our culture. So vitamin D deficiency is at an alarming rate of almost 80%, 80 to 90, I would say, even 88%, close to 90% in our pre-operative investigation. So I'm quite mm -hmm. curious, Daniel, when you say uh, there is no um, malnutrition in your cohort of patients, are you guys actually doing a pre and post operative comparison of at least these two vitamins, um, iron as well as um, vitamin D? Because if we were to look at the study that was presented just now, iron deficiency is almost 100% from what was yeah, of shared. Course, um, so we do a, a very large um, blood panel before and three months after the operation where we do um, um, lots of vitamins, vitamin D, A, E, B12, uh, and others. And what we see, we are um, we give these patients um, so high dose vitamin pills. And what we see is that they are normally after the operation much better than before, especially in vitamin D. So, but we have the same situation in Austria. So, um, if you're um, doing vitamin D panels in, in patients before an operation, um, the 90, up to 90% have deficiencies. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So that's well, something I, that I we currently we are, taking, um, are getting younger and younger, and we worry about pushing, in, pushing them into premature osteoporosis. That would be a big concern here. Mm. Yeah. I think one of the comments is, is which is very important is the length channel in some way, you know, I mean, we, we started uh, at the in 2010 hour study program at the time when SADI was recommended to be at 220 and we had 8% malnutrition and we had reversals. This was published in obesity surgery. And then when sliding from 250, it seems it 
could be an appropriate, but you still can have some malnutrition up to 2% in our series. We have more than 100 cases. But 3%, sometimes we have the, the doubt of, of what we are pulling. Now we are trying to investigate the role of study in primary surgery for BMIs, even 45, 55 but not at three, even thinking on tailoring the, the length. You know, I think we, we we need to give to the audience the idea of the, the tailoring of the length of each one. We, we need to try to talk about percentages of, of the total uh, common channel rather than thinking what we really know and they show it us is that two meters is too much, uh, too, too, too low. So this is something maybe the effect will have, no? Uh, I don't know. Uh, why Yang, if you want to comment something, uh, you come from China, yes. uh, you have had uh, uh, increased rates of obesity. I don't know if for the, the type of uh, eating behaviors you have in your country, this is a, a, an optimal procedure uh, in your case, or what do you, what is your opinion? Can you give us your, your feedback? Yes, thank you. And uh, last year in our Chinese obesity and metabolic surgery database, we had uh, more than uh, 12,000 cases in, in our country for all the metabolic surgery and major surgery. But for the studies, uh, we only record um, uh, 18 two cases, which uh, which is uh, which was uh, less than 1% of the total uh, uh, number. Exactly, is uh, zero point six percent. So uh, studies is not quite popular in in many in China. But uh, since uh, last year, uh, quite a lot of hospital try to uh, start doing uh, this procedure. Uh, maybe in the future, we, the number of cases will be increased. The most uh, concern uh, from the surgeons is uh, the nutritional uh, issue. Just like uh, uh, Renan just said. Uh, for the some uh, some type of uh, nutritional deficiency, even we have a 100% uh, happens in our our, our our patients. So that's our worries. Uh, why? And I think this is why uh, studies is not uh, popular in in many China. Now we had uh, uh, sleeve uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy uh, counts uh, more than uh, 198 percent of the total uh, procedure. The second is uh, when I get to bypass. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, in Chile, it's not very popular. Probably less than 5 percent of patients are undergoing a study, mostly higher BMIs. But I do have two questions for the audience, um, especially the one who have more experience. Number one, do you use Ursodiol for prevention of gallstones. Ramon, that you have more experience, what's your thought about that? And the second question for chronic diarrhea, we have had a few cases of chronic diarrhea difficult to manage uh, with 250 common channel. Uh, any tips to treat them uh, medically before considering revision of that surgery? Ramon and, uh, and I don't know, Tamer or Daniel, who got more experience with, uh, with SADI. So, so we don't do prophylaxis on the the colloidal uh, lithiasis uh, formation. Uh, <clears throat> what we do usually is to uh, do the cholecystectomy if we have uh, already uh, uh, gallstones there. Uh, and then for the diarrhea, I think this is very important and related to the length channel. We have seen a lot of malabsorptive and diarrhea, and this is something you must follow up, steatorrhea, diarrhea, and malabsorption, which is one of the key points of these uh, malabsorptive techniques, although it seems. Just going back to one comment, it seems it could be easier when higher BMIs to do a, a sleeve and then a study as a first stage than a gastric bypass because you 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 are much more comfortable. All the uh, anastomosis is, is lower in the abdomen, and this is something quite interesting. You no, know? the 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 great deal will be: uh, do we have to stage this approach? Which percentage of patients uh, we will won't need a malasophy procedure for the long term? And this is something very interesting. Uh, and comments. I, I think you ask uh, also uh, Tamer. Tamer is uh, uh, from uh, uh, Alexandria. Uh, maybe you want to give us some comments? 
Sure, sure. So I personally don't have experience with SADI, but I will give you what Egypt had. Egypt, we had easy legislation. So uh, and I think this was the problem is that everyone started to performing SADI uh, at the beginning of the expedience and they were more towards the uh, you know, shorter common channel, the 200, uh, you know, when, when it came out. And they got really bit by the complications of it. Um, I had colleagues doing, uh, showing me pictures of, of patients going into severe uh, edema and severe hypoalbuminemia and, and hair loss. And, and then you get you got those IBMI patients you, you want to reverse, but they're pretty unstable. So I think Egypt's experience started bad because we did, we, we followed the early data, but, you know, uh, looking at, at uh, Aust uh, Austria's experience and going longer and the new data coming out, I think Saudi should have a chance, especially as an original uh, uh, savior of, the, of a phase C. Okay, and thank I you. I would like to add uh, our experience in Mexico. Guillermo uh, Ponce de Leon told us something about what's happening, but uh, I would like to include that uh, in 2017, uh, we performed the first studies at a public institution. Um, we invited Dr. Andres Sanchez Pernaute, who is uh, one of the um, uh, inventors of this procedure with Dr. Antonio Torres, and we performed with them uh, the first cases in Mexico in a public institution, and we chose the, um, some patients uh, who had a, a sleep, a previous sleep. So, in my opinion, I think that, uh, as Guillermo also said, it's a great procedure for those patients who are uh, increasing weight after a sleep, and in my opinion, I, I am saying that if uh, an SLIF is the major procedure performed in all the world and uh, also in Mexico, I think that it's uh, much better to convert um, a SLIF to a SADIS than to convert to probably a gastric, a one way gastric bypass. This uh, probably is uh, due uh, because of the length of the limb that you were commenting as well. And I think that uh, obviously we need to um, to select to do a very good selection of the patients uh, because we know that uh, they can have uh, many nutritional deficiencies, as Raimu also asked. Uh, so we have to to be uh, to have a lot of careful about these patients, and our experience was very good about with these patients. We didn't have uh, too much complications, and also I know that in nutrition they in the nutrition center uh, where Guillermo was doing his fellowship, I think. Uh, also, they are performing some cases, and I think that it's a very good procedure that we can have access to perform to our patients, uh, but mm -hmm. most in the cases of provisional surgery. Diana, Diana, in those cases that you convert from sleep to study, if they do have a dilated stomach, do you do a real sleep also, or just the study? Mm -hmm. We don't have this experience in the cases where I participate. Uh, we didn't do in any case any uh, risk lift. But in the studies of Dr. Sanchez Bernaute and Dr. Antonio Torres, they are saying that, of course, if, if you include this uh, risk lift at the procedure, of course, you can increase the, uh, the weight loss uh, of the patients. Yeah. Great. I think it, this is a very nice comment, and this gives us the opportunity to do the second pool, which was related to what to do after the, the most uh, popular in many countries uh, bariatric procedure, which is the primary sleep. We give uh, 10, 15 seconds, no more, to answer. We check the pool, and maybe the panelists can give some uh, comments, and we'll do some uh, final conclusions, and uh, then we'll go to the second topic. Okay, so as you can see, uh, risk leave is an option, less than 10%, but most of the options turn to uh, the traditional or distal gastric bypass, 
One anastomosis is, is gaining popularity after sleep, which is something we, we see also in the publications. And sadly, I would say 30%. Maybe this is a, a biage because of the audience, which is very uh, interested in the topic. However, we uh, panelists are not voting. Marcos, do you want to give some comments about the results, advices? Yeah, probably that's that's a reality. I mean, uh, most of us consider, uh, especially if they do have a, a GERD, if they do have reflux disease, uh, of, of course, that's the first option to convert to a room wide gastric bypass. But I think we should start considering uh, converting to SADI in Chile, we don't do much one anastomosis gastric bypass because of gastric cancer and concerns about the bile reflux. That's why we do not consider that option. But uh, I think SADI is a good option nowadays um, and we should start considering. Very interesting. Short comments, short messages for the audience. Anyone? So our, our, our algorithm in Vienna is that um, when we have a sleeve gastrectomy patients suffering from GERD and weight regain, then we go for a wound gastric bypass. And if we only have weight regain, then we do a SADIS procedure with free sleeve. This is a key point uh, message. I see you handling the... Go ahead. Okay, in Czech, uh, uh, if the patient is uh, satisfied or was satisfied previously with the uh, restrictive regime and there is no GERD, uh, we continue with restrictive procedure. Uh, if not, uh, we do uh, BPD. Okay, I think some uh, some randomized trials comparing uh, uh, BPD versus SADI uh, seem that BPD is better the weight in the long term at five years compared to SADI. So SADI. Although it turns in the second stage the patient to a, a better weight, the, the, the BPDDS stays better than the study in the long term. However, these are uh, the, one of the best evidence we, we can have. No, uh, I think we need to, co to, to consider where we come from, either if it's a super obesity and we treat it as a two stage or as a single stage, but especially for those patients in which the sleeve has not been uh, effective because of a, a bad response to the surgery. So the, uh, it's not necessarily a bad technique, but the, the patient responded badly, uh, a partial response to the surgery, then it's time to consider the, the procedure. I would say contraindication when GERD, esophagitis is present, and this has to be clearly uh, recommended not to go for a study if the hiatus is not controlled. Any other comment from the panelists? Beautiful panel. I think uh, SADI as a revisional procedure makes a very good argument. It make, I mean, there are some good points. Um, I can see why why it would make a good option. But again, my concern coming from a country with some micronutritional deficiencies in our cohort would be, I would be curious to know about the reproductive or uh, fertility outcomes following such a procedure in the long run, considering that our patients are getting younger and younger, because I think uh, fertility is a good marker of nutrition. So if you're not yeah. seeing much of a positive outcome in terms of pregnancy for underlying patients with maybe metabolic syndrome and PCOS following such procedures, now that's something to be, um, you know, maybe we need to inform the patients as well about these things, that nutritional deficiencies may not be so favorable in terms of fertility if that's something that they're looking forward to, especially in younger patients. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We Just should move on, on. Ramon. We continue to the session two. Uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, Dr. Carlos Serwek, a Mexican friend. Uh, he's the head of the department of the bariatric unit of, at the Mexico City Hospital, professor of bariatric surgery by the National University, and he's going to share with us metabolic surgery and class 1 obesity, a prospective study with short, mid, and long-term results among Latinos. Carlos, welcome. Hi everyone, welcome to our session of a Young IFSO. Uh, this time it's the Latin American chapter and I'm glad, to thank you for the invitation and also because you consider me as a young guy, so that's even better. So uh, this time we're going to talk about our latest paper, which is metabolic surgery and class 1 obesity, which is uh, BMI on the 35. 
It was a prospective study with short, mid, and long-term results among uh, Latinos, uh, Mexican patients. Uh, the setting was a uh, uh, general hospital in Mexico City in, uh, in the bariatric unit that I have the opportunity to run. So before starting, uh, let's remember that uh, it's already established that surgery is the best treatment against uh, diabetes. So if we see this, uh, this analysis, even though we have uh, BMI under 35, we have the same results in patients with BMI over 35, which goes in favor, in favors surgery. These are, these are all randomized control trials. So following that, and all the studies uh, that have been performed in the last uh, 34 years, uh, some years ago, the, the statement, the joint statement of all these organizations that you already know, they established the algorithm to follow and if we focus on, on, the, on the subject that we're um, presenting today, we have this kind of patients. So we're gonna go and we have class one uh, obesity patients with the poor glycemic control. And also that you're gonna see, we also have uh, those with adequate glycemic control. I'm gonna guide you through this. So the method, it's a prospective study with the patients with BMI between 30 and 34.9 with the type two diabetes. The surgery was a primary room wide gastric bypass, no revisions, no sleeves, no patients with uh, balloons. Uh, they were all above 18 years old and under 70 years old. The, the confection, the, well, the, the way we did the bypass, it was a, a, we considered it as a standard bypass, which is a limitary limb of 150 centimeters and a biliopancreatic limb of 70 centimeters. This was performed at one institution and we started the, the surgeries in 2013 and we ended up following patients and at the end of the study, the last surgeries were performed uh, in 2017. So we performed baseline, baseline analysis at 12, 24, 36 and 60 months. The primary objective was to understand or to see the metabolic outcomes, especially type 2 diabetes uh, remission, all the different kinds of remissions that we have. Uh, the laboratory tests, which includes everything that has that is related with the with metabolic outcomes, also a lipidic profile. Secondarily, but within the, the primary objectives, we uh, also uh, analyzed weight loss in terms of percentage of excess weight loss and percentage of total weight loss. A secondary uh, uh, objective, we did a subgroup analysis with two types of uh, patients or two groups. First one, the first group has uh, only had one drug for type two diabetes uh, before surgery, but no insulin. And we compare it to another group that had two or more drugs uh, before surgery with or without insulin. So for the definition of uh, remission, which is always a problem with all the studies uh, available where everyone is saying uh, different or they're considering different ways of reporting this, uh, we'll stick to the original uh, uh, classification that started or it was changed in 2009 that basically is the one that you already know. Complete remission is one year without medication with normal uh, glucose and normal uh, HbA1c, okay, under 6%. What we consider, when we consider relapse or when we restarted uh, medication again, where was the threshold of 6.5% of a HbA1c, and we always started with metformin unless the patient had any uh, GI symptoms. So this is only to, to go with the same definitions that the, the ADA was, is using. Uh, it's the same that both organizations, uh, including bariatric surgery, they recommend. So we also uh, reported a partial remission, improvement, and relapse. Special considerations. What is this? 
So we, we did the design in 2012, which is almost 10 years ago. The study started, or the first patients started to be operated on 2013. And I'm writing here that we, the guidelines that we are using right now, they, they went out in 2016. So we started before any of these guidelines. That's why in our study, uh, we included every patient that was willing to participate despite type of treatment which is very interesting what you're gonna see at the end of the analysis. And this is what, what I want to show you before starting. We consider that we have three types of patients with diabetes. So we have the first type of patient, which is uh, obesity class one, that, it's con uh, that has good control with uh, only one drug and, and diet and maybe exercise. So this patient is not considered in the actual guidelines to be a, a candidate for, for bariatric surgery. Then you have a, this other type of patient, which is also under class one obesity, but he needs more drugs, but not insulin. And then you have this third patient that requires insulin and maybe some other uh, type two diabetes uh, related drugs. So as you can see, we have three types of patients with the same disease. And the thing here is that we don't, we don't have only to see a diabetes because most of these patients have some other problems. Some might have uh, problems with the cholesterol, uh, the dyslipidemia. Uh, some other will have uh, patients, uh, some other patients will have problems with the uh, hypertension. So it's not a single disease that is within these patients. So it becomes a little bit more complicated, which opens the door to be, uh, to have more, uh, a sooner treatment. So in our minds, what we have is these types of, of patients. We have patients with, we can say, male disease, moderate and severe disease. So in our results, first of all, the baseline analysis, we ended up having 51 patients. Uh, they were all, most of them, they were young with a, with a BMI of 33.1 and uh, on less than five years of diagnosis, type two diabetes diagnosis. And if, as you can see, we had patients with very good control, which is it's, it's going to have a lot of influence eventually. You're going to see it. The rest of the analysis is normal as another one. But look at here, half of patients, they had hypertension and more than half had a dyslipidemia. That's what I was saying, that there's not only uh, a square-minded type of patients with diabetes. They have more diseases, which they can lead you to a better uh, or more uh, prompt surgery. So the table two is extremely long. So I just uh, did some important instruction. So uh, if we see what happened with these patients, I only put the results at two years and five years, the, where, where most of the changes are uh, present. If you can see here, the excess weight loss at two years in every, for the complete cohort was almost around 90%. But after five years, it was 74%. All these results are very comparable to, to all every other uh, analysis that you can find, even with patients uh, with a BMI above 35. Then what happens with the metabolic profile? As you can see, we did surgery in quite controlled patients. You can see the glucose here and the uh, AB, uh, A1C here. They went uh, below six after two years with very good glucose control. But what happened after five years, they both are quite close to the normal threshold we are using uh, thanks to the ADA organization. Insulin and HOMA, we also measured those. And uh, this is a very important thing, what kind of medication they were using. If we can see, of course, every patient at baseline require any kind of drug. At two years, only 8.18, 0.4% require any drug. And at five years, this is dramatically increased at almost half of patients needed some kind of treatment. What is very important here is that the insulin use, despite all these medication that was required after five years, if you can see here, only one patient require insulin again. So this is also a thing that has been observed in some other studies that despite that you will eventually go out of complete remission, you will be still better controlled 
that maybe if you were not operated and you might not require insulin. What about the, the, uh, the global remission rates? Uh, I'm gonna talk here about all the kinds of remissions that we have here. So let's focus on complete remission, which is the dark bar. So at 12 months, so it's one year, 80% of patients, 81.6 had remission, which is consistent with some other BMI, some other series. What happens at two years, it went down and we started to see patients with, uh, with more improvement. But look at here, we start to have more patients with recurrence. So already at two years, we have 5% of patients with recurrence. And then this go down and down as, the, as this one increases over years. And look at five years, only half of patients were still having complete remission. And we had almost 20% of patients with relapse, which it also is comparable to the few uh, studies that analyze all this, uh, but most of them are in patients with BMI above 35. What is very interesting also in a study is that we decided to compare patients with meal disease. By meal disease, we'd say that they only require one drug at baseline against the other patients with, we can say, moderate and severe disease, which is two or more drugs uh, on baseline plus or not with insulin. So here's what we can see the first difference. If we follow the, the, the HbA1c percentage in, in green, we have patients that were extremely well controlled because they had a mild disease. And if they went to the, if they went to the operating room, we can see that after five years, they continue to have very, very control, very glucose control and HbA1c compared with those patients that had a moderate and or severe disease that despite, despite having an quite uh, okay control, uh, after five years, they will, they will, they were, they were gonna be uh, around 6.5 of, of HV A1C. So here we can start observing the differences between doing or performing surgery in patients that are uh, with mild disease against uh, some other patients that are not that well or not well controlled. So if we put this into the remission uh, models, we can see here group A, let's remember group A it's patients uh, with meal disease. Look at this 100% of remission, complete remission of 12 months. It's been a while since I don't see 100% in, in these kind of surgeries, but it's 100% because they have meal disease, of course, against uh, 70, uh, uh, sorry, 57% uh, of patients with moderate or severe disease. What happens at two years? This group is still with extremely high complete remission rates against this other group that they went down to 50%. And what happens at five years? This is the most impressive part. At five years, 75% of patients that originally had mild disease, they, will, they were still under complete remission. And uh, there was only 25% of those patients with severe disease that had complete remission after five years. And look at all this. This is, this is not that bad because uh, even though they are not into the classification, they have improvement. I mean, they're still under good control with one drug maybe. And what we can see here is that the, we don't have uh, in this group patients uh, like these patients. So it translates again. I mean, there are not, these are not that many patients, but it gives, a, gives us a glimpse about uh, if we do surgery in uh, early stages, that this might be okay. Uh, the other thing that I want to show, this is not in the original paper, this, this is in a, in a big table, is that this is also related to weight loss. Uh, if we can see here, remember group A, the excess weight loss after five years was way, way beyond patients with in group B. So which one is the cause? Is it the weight, the weight regain that brings back the diabetes or is the, the chronic diabetes that, that it will be, it affects weight loss at the end? We don't know because we don't have that many patients to do a deeper analysis. 
but at least there's something here that we can uh, somebody else can explore with uh, with more patients. So as a conclusion, we already know that laparoscopic gastric bypass safe metabolic procedure in uh, for patients with class one obesity uh, resulting in important type two diabetes uh, remission rates uh, at mid long uh, short mid and long term follow ups. Every parameter, I didn't put it here because it's too much information, but the rest of the parameters analyzed, they improve, as you all can imagine. And this is the important thing, I believe. Patients with milder forms of, of diabetes have better metabolic results after surgery than those patients require more drugs and increased rates for relapse were observed. Of course, there are always a lot of limitations, and the main is the, the small number of patients. We had a, a 40% forty uh, percent of uh, follow-up at five years, but we don't have that many patients. We have less than 20. So the lack of a control group, that will be very interesting to use it or compare it against medical management or another type of surgery, maybe sleep gastrectomy, that will be a very interesting paper. And uh, we didn't have uh, CPET levels for every patient. And it, it will be very interesting to follow these patients another five years. Despite this, this is the first uh, prospective study in Latino patients uh, that have been followed for that long. And we also improve or we're bringing a new, maybe not a new things that we had in mind, the, 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 to go and maybe we can offer surgery a little bit beyond the algorithms that we know. But that's a consideration. It depends of every patient. I know there, are every country. I know there are countries in Latin America where they cannot even do surgery in patients with BMI under 35 and, and uncontrolled diabetes. But this can be uh, maybe a game changer in, in the future. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we're going to be ready for some questions. Thank you again. Okay, back connected, Marcos. Thank you very much, Carlos. Very nice presentation. And um, we did, uh, we presented and published three years ago a paper about sleep gastrectomy only for low BMIs, 30 and 35. And uh, we found if you can turn off the, the microphone, because then we some, have some echoes. Yeah, we okay. found that- Can you hear me? Because I just yeah. arrived to the hospital, sorry. Can you hear okay, me? Carlos, we can hear you, yes. I was commenting that we, uh, we published an experience with um, more than 400 patients three years ago, low BMI, 3035, only sleep gastrectomy. And we look at the subset of patients with diabetes in that group. There, all of them were well-controlled diabetics with a hemoglobin A1C of seven, and after three years came down to about 5.7. And uh, they had, um, most of them, we had complete remission in 60%, and 40% we had uh, improvement. So very similar results with your experience here. So I think we're having more and more evidence that the sooner the better we can intervene in this patient. So, I would like to ask you, Carlos, based on these results, are you planning to do some changes in the indication for diabetics the, to indicate surgery earlier? What's the, the opinion of your colleagues from the medical field about that? We cannot hear you, Carlos. Now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, Marcos, we have discussed your paper, very nice paper. You're the only one that has that kind of paper in the world. So based on your findings and, and our findings, I think that, uh, yes, we can offer, offer surgery sooner. And it's what we always say, you need to get in your team uh, endocrinologists and clinicians that are like pro surgery, which is very hard to find. Uh, but now, what I have been seeing, and maybe it's what you, a lot of you have been seeing, is that 
the patients, the, they start to know about this, so they skip sometimes the, those doctors and they come straight to you and ask for this type of surgery, even though they are with only metformin or, or in, in the first stages. What, what I think that is gonna change, and I've been doing it in my practice, is that I'm using, as you used, sleep in this, in this young patients with a storing disease, easy to control diabetes, or older patients, uh, with the same type of, of diabetes. If I have a young patient with very extremely hard to control diabetes, uh, I will go for bypass. But I think that will change and, and that will be a very nice study for someone to do because there are no studies like that. But I believe that uh, we have to start. It's not easy because in some countries, like for example in Argentina, I believe they don't even have, they are not allowed to operate on, on their 35 of BMI despite any guidelines, any uh, insulin, so that's another thing to to be aware. Uh, all this was into a, um, in in the public setting with uh, all the all the ethical committees and and all that all those things. But we start to do it also in the private sector without problems. So the patient has to be very aware, uh, and you have to stick to the local law or the medical whatever because the, you can have a problem if this patient has a complication. Right. Any any comments uh, of the the other panelists? Erin, yes. We cannot hear you, Erin. Okay. Uh, thank you for the paper. Uh, we are trying to publish a similar paper on 400 patients with transit B partition, and the BMI range is between 28 uh, to 35. So the BMI range is very low. Uh, but the problem is these patients are, as you said, self-paying patients because normally we cannot operate them by government insurance. And if a complication happens, <laughs> you'll be sued and all the people will come to you, come up to you, all the bariatric community. As we are trying to publish this paper, which was retrospective, considering four years of results with 73% remission, uh, with complete remission rate, even with diabetics uh, after 10 years uh, with some complications. So it's a very large series uh, with Dr. All from another city in Turkey, because in Turkey people, they don't wanna use insulin. So it's a major concern for them, maybe because of the cultural reasons. They don't want to use the needles. So I know it's not ethical to do sometimes the patients with metformin, or a single oral antibiotic drugs, uh, oral anti-diabetic drugs. But I think it's reasonable in patients with like case by case in uncontrolled diabetes. So I think these papers should be published to give the results and to show the community in some part, like group of patients, how it works in low BMI. But as I experienced, when I send it to this paper for publication in a major journal, uh, they rejected just because, uh, not because of the paper is a low quality, but because of the, like, how do these patients pay? How do you get the, like, the law restrictions out of the sites? And how they do they allow in your hospital to, like, to, to, to these patients? So I think we have to know more and there should be a transparency, transparency when you have an IRB approval. What, what do you think? What you're saying, Erin, it's exactly what happened when we published the first year experience of this series of patients, because we, we published it uh, around before 2016. So the top two main journals we all know, they answered me the same that you are saying, that why are we doing these surgeries in patients with meal disease, which is outside of guidelines. And I was explaining, come on guys, I did this before your guidelines and we're having good results. At the end, we ended up publishing in, in the surgical endoscopy, so because they're not that square-minded. And now I didn't have any trouble to publish it in obesity surgery because now we're starting to know that maybe performing surgeries earlier is, is, is the way to go. But it's the same that happened to you. Uh, it's not the, I mean, if the, if the reviewers, they, they think it's not okay, they will know they're not that, uh, transparent as you say but we had exactly the same problem years ago okay. Thank there you. Some, uh, it's a very large sure. go go Erin. 
sure, sure, Tamer, you can comment. I will just say that it should be published because very like series. So because it will be a nice paper to show what happens. All right. Uh, thank you, Carlos, uh, for your work and your presentation, of course. Um, I, I had a question from a technical point of view and a metabolic point of view. So you, you mentioned you did the standard way with a PP limb of 70 centimeters, 75 centimeters uh, or so. Uh, do you do it any differently for patients with a higher BMI as far as the bypass? Uh, and from a technical point of view, I have, I have good experience uh, uh, with those patients. And I would say when we have on the list, the long list, and we have the low BMI patients, I think they would be easier, but actually uh, with, some of them are younger, never been pregnant before. They sort of have a, like a smaller domain. And sometimes it's more difficult, surprisingly. Uh, I was wondering if you had the same issues uh, with your experience. Yeah, yeah totally. For, for the first question, uh, actually this, uh, this like two weeks ago, we just published a paper of a long BP lean versus short in, in, in SOAR, but we, we didn't include these patients because we, we wanted to do a regular bypass, which back in 2012, it was like this, a standard bypass. Now we know the role of bp -Link. Let's remember this again 10 years ago. So, uh, but with, uh, not, with the other uh, prospective trial where we compared these two bp uh, the only uh, malnutrition case we have, it was, a, it was a 35 of BMI. So we stopped doing it despite having insulin and all that. I think the risks are too are too 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 high to have a big BP limb in patients that their BMI they're not that high, and the other yes that's completely true. If they sound very easy and then you go inside and they are more like uh, uh, I don't know the, the, there's a lack of fat and then you have a more bleeding uh, like more inflammation. Yeah. I totally you sometimes I have my worst nightmares in patients under 35 and sometimes about 50 of BMI. So we stop to. To, to thinking that these are fellow cases, yeah. these are the only ones we didn't allow the fellows to operate. At the beginning it was, but then we said, no, 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 because I actually we're doing a, 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 a control trial. So yeah, totally agree. I have, we have seen the same. Any other comment? There's an experience in uh, Guatemala. For coming from Dr. Lopez uh, mentioning that was already presented, uh, in which they 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 work on the one anastomosis gastric bypass also in uh, low BMI population. So I don't know if you have any experience, Carlos, uh, with one anastomosis. Not me no, also no. for low populations. Very no, limited I, in Spain. I, I strongly agree not to go for one anastomosis in in low BMIs because it will mimic a long BP limb. Rue and Y, uh, unless you do a small 150 uh, centimeters mini gastric, maybe, but most of them they're using 200. In Mexico, people they're 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 skipping half of the of the bowel, so that's I have seen a lot of problems with those patients. I don't like, advise those. I advise it to another kind of patients, like a B partition. They pr they presented 20 cases. Any other comment about uh, the the management, the the strategy to to how to to improve these uh, low BMIs, according to the possibilities in your countries, but also about uh, experiences you might have had uh, in uh, patients you treated. I think Carlos, one very interesting thing is uh, which comes back to the to the limb length. No, it's it's about the necessity of measuring and understanding also in these patients the comorbidities added to these patients. No, we, we need to understand that although we are doing two, three, four different uh, treatments, we need to understand that we can tailor them and we can give them a, a specific way and, and giving them uh, the, the shape and also the, the measurements that might make all the, uh, the treatments uh, much better. I don't know if any of you have experience just to put some more controversy on the debate about ileal interposition. Maybe more experimental, maybe. Okay. There are no Brazilians Marcos. here. <laughs> there are no Brazilians. <laughs> they were not invited. Eh? Here uh, we'll, uh, Luciana, Luciana, we'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll ask Eren and, 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 and especially Diana. Eh? Diana, what happened here? Eh? Okay. But uh, we are joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are joking, Diana. <laughs> I am here just hearing you, but uh, sorry because I have to close my camera. 
yeah. Uh, I you, would you just know, like a... to to add uh, something interesting for low BMI, for example. I had uh, some patients who performed uh, previously uh, fundification, for example, and they are not of, uh, uh, with um, a BMI blo uh, more than 30, uh, but they are still having reflux or uh, some other condition. So uh, this is another option uh, to convert this fundiplication to a gastric bypass, uh, but they are not having a very high BMI. So I think that is another uh, thing uh, to, um, to perform this kind of procedure. I, do, I don't know if some one of you have uh, some experience with reflux patients with low BMI. So if, if you allow me, now we are doing, in, uh, from the National Society, we are doing a, a retrospective study with five years follow-up minimum on uh, trying to share uh, BMI or 30 to 40, depending on who sees the patient, either the general surgeon who does the atalernia or the bariatric surgeon who will think on gastric bypass. 30, 35, we will think bypass. Maybe a general surgeon will go for Nissen fund duplication. And I think this is a category of patients in which can benefit from bariatric surgery at the same time that are solving a very special issue, which is uh, worsened by obesity, but also by the, the dysfunction of the yarus, like uh, GERD, uh, which is a very interesting topic. Um, some more comments, uh, maybe, or questions? I saw, I saw only that there was a question in the chat, so we can maybe talk about that. It is to, to Carlos. Um, it's um, the question if there is if you looked at a relationship between diabetes remission and the length of the disease. Yes, uh, we did. The, the, the paper is extremely long with very long uh, tables. So yeah, uh, we 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 saw what everybody knows that longer uh, type uh, longer time with the diabetes. Uh, worse uh, pancreatic reserve, uh, more drugs, and all those things. So what we wanted to do, and was uh, one of the comments of most of my reviewers was, uh, why are you using this way of only comparing uh, guys, uh, patients using one drug versus the others? And I answered, this is the easiest way for us surgeons to 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 pick up a patient instead of starting using the the A A B C D scale or the or the at the RM or all those things. And it will always, almost always predict, as we can see, that uh, if you have a patient with mild disease, which is one drug, maybe two drugs and well controlled, he will have a better disease. It's like cancer surgery. It's, it's like that. So yes, the worse the patients, the, 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 the worse the results. The only thing that we found at the end that it's the, a big question is, is it re weight related? Those patients that started to, to have drugs again, they had worse weight loss. So what was what is first? Because they were diabetic, like very bad patients, and then that's why they didn't lose that much weight. Or is it the opposite? They started to re to regain weight, and that's why they started with the diabetes again. So that's a big question that I, I believe nobody really can answer. So we we already we saw this thing, and uh, we, we we don't we, we cannot state nothing because we don't have uh, more than 50 or 100 patients to do a, a um, a good, a nicer analysis, but that's the that's the thing that we will remind there. So, uh, Carlos, can I ask um, one more question, please? Um, a very nice, very nice presentation. Your paper is very amazing. Of course, we are dreaming also of such randomized studies more in in Europe. Uh, um, but I'm 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 asking about how how you got your patients uh, uh, with such PMI asking for a surgery or you cooperated with with with, uh, with uh, endocrinologists because such patients are not presenting to us uh, as normal in the surgical uh, units asking for for surgery with diabetes so how you reached your number of, of patients it for us is very easy because i have a bariatric unit with every specialist so i'm the chief <laughs> so all the endocrinologists they like they work for me and all everyone uh, we have, they are pro surgery since day one, so it's easier like that. But that's not the general setting. So I just 
uh, proposed, we can do this, we can do that, and then we just present it to the committees, and they say, it was a, it was a wild time, they didn't know, so they would say, well, yeah, you can start doing this. Now I think it will be harder because there, there are already some guidelines. So we have this window of opportunity, so we didn't have a problem. But yeah, that's that's a big thing. That's why we don't have randomized control trials on this subject with uh, well-controlled patients. Why are they going to go to surgery? But now you have a paper that you can show sometimes. Thank you. Great. Mustafa, I think you need to move to Malaysia. We've got patients with BMI as low as 26 knocking on our door asking for surgery and we have to turn them away. We're like, no, no surgery for you. So that's that's something we that are, we are saying. We are, not, we, we are fighting to operate patients um, uh, under, under 50 BMI uh, and 40 plus uh, should be very, very uh, conservative with, with at least six months conservative program. That, that's why I was wondering uh, to reach patients with 25 PMI and uh, and diabetes and how they came to the uh, to the obesity surgery. I think you'll you'll find a lot of papers um, from East Asia, Taiwan, right, Japan, looking at very very low BMIs, 27.5, having metabolic surgery done. I think uh, in this region of the world, we tend to see more of those numbers. Yeah, of course. The, the and insurance younger, system lot, and, the, and the guidelines is very, very um, strict in, in Germany. That's why it's also difficult. We tried before in Heidelberg uh, such a study and it, it was not completed because of patients' recruitment here. Yeah. I have some more co comments, may I? Uh, as the low BMI patient, I always join uh, much at, uh, to us, more, but uh, most of the uh, clinical study, they are in small sample size or in single center or in single uh, country. So I'm thinking if any one of us are interested in conducting some uh, multinational uh, study uh, on the surgical treatment of the low BMI patient, so we can try to build up uh, a global uh, evidence on this group of patients, especially for low BMI. What do you think? Actually, well, I try, I try to do that. Sorry, uh, I'm going to jump because my battery is about to die. I tried to do that with the uh, with the patients, Latino patients that they were raised in the U.S., born in the U.S. Uh, to compare it with those here in Mexico, but you know the U.S. is very hard to do randomized control trials with those guys, and so it's hard. But we can do some global things because in most of our countries we are allowed to do these surgeries. Or maybe not as extreme as uh, we, we did it in my study, but I think we have to compare that and. And I, sorry, I interrupted. If I go uh, from the picture, I will go back with my iPhone. Any other comment, maybe? And in uh, in many uh, Asian guidelines, um, the lowest uh, BMI is as low as uh, 25 to uh, 27.5 if they have uh, metabolic disorders they can uh, conduct some uh, experimental surgery for this group of patients. I'm not sure if it's allowed in, in, in your country. Like it's not allowed, it's not allowed in Turkey, but they advertise to private hospitals, they advertise on TV, like for diabetes surgery. If, if nothing happens to the patient, then, then you can do it. But the problem is the patients see this as a like a big opportunity for treating diabetes. We had that problem real interposition too. There was one surgeon who was doing real interposition in Turkey, uh, more than two thousand cases. And there is another colleague of mine. We we also compare one anastomosis gastric bypass with transit partition. I do some limited series of one anastomosis gastric bypass, hundred centimeters. I think we're going to publish that with uh, comparing with transit B partition. But because these procedures are experimental, as like they are accepted as experimental still uh, by IFSO and also by global community. So if anything happens to the patient, then you have no rights. But because of the market, you know, it's, I know it's unethical. I do it with IRB approval, but they, they ask, and there are lots of things coming from abroad from Germany, 
Lots of patients from Kosovo, lots of patients from which they, uh, they come for surgery for diabetes. So I think there should be a position statement or a global study to control uh, these. And I think maybe we can put it into a guidelines for limited, like in limited patients. There's, there is one uh, uh, proposition in uh, guidelines, like case by case. But I think it should be explained more clearly to solve this problem, because we have a lot of problem here in Turkey. Maybe we can set up a bottom line, for example, uh, uh, twenty-seven point five or thirteen two, which is accepted uh, in most of the countries. Then we can try to start some uh, multinational studies on on the low BMI patient. It, de it depends on how you define uh, low BMI. Yes, because you know, we can say that we are on Asian part also, but this is 27. But if <laughs> if you say it, you are on the Europe, then it's you know more than 30. So it's it's really you cannot depends decide. On the, yeah, depends on the river. It's like this. What what is very interesting, and, and I think you pointed it, is that we we need to and to to pro to to conduct studies like the ones that. Uh, uh, Dr. Zurwek presented us, and I think in this uh, BMI we need to to take the help of our colleagues endocrinologists, and I think this is very important to give um, reliability and and also the the all the expertise to the to the fact that we are operating uh, I would say overweighted or obesity class one patients, and this is something which. Uh, has to be ruled in a very clear way. And I think although you go through an ethical committee and it's about marketing, I, I have doubts about the ethical committee, which is very important to, to point that. Uh, I think it's very important to, to clearly uh, uh, try to make a very controlled trials like the the, the ones we, we have seen, and there are many, but uh, always uh, thinking on the benefit of the patient and, the, and, uh, and for the uh, scientific community. We we're talking about metabolic surgery over the oh, last yeah. over the last ten years. Oh, sorry. And um, even in the Lancet recently appeared uh, published uh, that showed that for obese and diabetics you increase life expectancy nine years uh, compared with only obese five years. So the evidence is very strong. However, in spite of that, I have seen that we haven't had much progress. We still have very low referrals from diabetologists and endocrinologists, probably it's the same as your experience. I think they were not doing a good job. I don't know why. Or maybe because they have better drugs, uh, the guys who treat diabetics. But I don't know the experience, for example, of Karin in, in uh, Prague and uh, Daniel. What about the experience with diabetics? Do you get referrals? You don't get referrals because in Chile it's very low referral. So in Austria, if I can start, maybe so in Austria, the problem is that the insurance don't cover these patients. Yeah, so we have um, the statement from the ADA, which is clear based on 15 um, randomized controlled trials. So I think the evidence is very clear that we can uh, really help this um, low um, BMI patients. But the problem is, yeah, the insurance we are um, from the University of Vienna. Uh, always um, try to talk with the insurance about these rules, but so far um, it's not covered. So this is the problem right now. But I think in the in the future um, this will more and more being a topic, and I think more and more countries um, will maybe allow to to operate on these patients. Karen. In Czech, we operate on patients uh, in, with low BMI, uh, obesity, uh, grade one, uh, and mostly they are diabetics and it's covered uh, uh, by insurance. Uh, so uh, we have some numbers of uh, patients who underwent uh, bariatric procedures or better say metabolic procedures uh, in, with, in uh, low BMI, but it's not a huge number, it's around uh, 100 uh, patients uh, uh, during uh, five years. Okay, so in, so um, our experience in Malaysia is that um, the referral pathway from our endocrinology colleagues is probably less than ten percent. I would say we we face the the same um, 
things that you guys are facing. So one strategy that we um, adopted, I mean, being a small country was, um, I guess we realized that we needed to get out more and do roadshows and speak about um, bariatric surgery, metabolic surgery, um, start creating more awareness because the diabetic rates in Malaysia is off the charts. Almost one in three Malaysians are deemed diabetic, but they don't know that bariatric surgery is an option, even though even though it is in our guidelines and there is a referral pathway existing from the endocrinologist to us, but there's not much talk about it. So in the last five years, I think uh, most of the surgeons performing bariatric surgery in this country have either opened up social media accounts or they've actually embarked on, of course, uh, pre-COVID area, we used to almost on a monthly basis give public talks. Um, it used to be a lot of live roadshows. That means you're going to big, big like banks. You start off with banks. You start off with the um, maybe electrical companies, printing companies, big, big corporations, and you get, you get in touch with their um, human resource, and then you start you start giving these talks. And that's why we actually went down to that ground level and started speaking more and and now you've got patients literally knocking our door and, and telling us that they want this surgery even then we still haven't achieved our target and i think there's so much more that can be done to get more people uh coming in and getting the appropriate treatment but but i agree with you guys if we're going to wait for for that referral to come from the endocrine side we we might be waiting for a very long time Any other comments? If not, we can. Yeah, I just have to add, uh, uh, um, Rhino. Um, so we have also to take care not not to get it in in a commercial way. I think that's why some serious endocrinologists are still afraid uh, sending the patients um, because sometimes we are very offensive in the bariatric field with our advertisement. Uh, catching patients uh, and we lose our uh, that there's seriously of of the of such kind of operations so we have to take care because at least met metabolic surgery will be more dangerous as obesity surgery we have to have teamwork very professional because the follow up for such patients patients are very very important patient will be operated and then we have to cooperate if we are doing such art of, of surgeries with with endocrinologists so it's, it's not the way that the patients are coming and knocking the doors and asking for surgery. I think it's a very teamwork and we have to, the, the indication for such surgery should be very restricted and uh, which kind of diabetics will be operated and, uh, and which not. Uh, otherwise we will have big problem. I agree with and the you. Guidelines, so, so I think the British you. guidelines and the Diabetes Summit 2016 is, uh, is published a very, very nice uh, recommendation. It's very clear regarding the metabolic surgery and i don't think that we will reach the point that everyone who has diabetes controlled will be operated correct so or the not. dss guidelines is something that is printed and and put up on on the walls of our clinic and i think even in the endocrine clinic but what what i was trying to say is that patients now are becoming more aware because of these public talks that we give and then so rep so we instead of getting the referrals from the endocrine what we do is when we get these patients and we see them and then we rope in the endocrine so that works better in our favor in that mdt in in, in an mdt way but it comes through us you get what i mean so patients come to us yeah. because of that increased awareness but then we rope in our endocrine colleagues so we still have that mdt going on it's not a um, unilateral surgical decision that is taken but um just to maybe share our experience on how we got more patients coming in rather than just waiting for that referral from from our endocrine colleagues so this way, um, both teams are happy, you know, because surgery is performed in a in a safe manner. And in terms of public publicity, Malaysia has very strict guidelines. We are not supposed to be um, making it into a business. It's more of awareness. We can say, speak to your doctor. Even when we give public talks, we have to say, go meet your doctor, go meet um, um, your surgeon. We never say, come and meet us, because that that can get you in a lot of trouble with the medical council. I think these are are very great comments and and advices. I don't know, uh, Marcos, if we are ready to to close the session and we'll give uh, the the opportunity to the to Diana and also of obviously Aaron to 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 close the session. Uh, from my side, I would like to thank everybody and and let Marcos uh, 
give final okay words thank also. you for all the panelists all the attendants and my co co-moderator ramon very nice to talk to you and to you all and we are going to leave our the final words for our chair chairwoman and chairman erin and diana please to close the session okay ladies first diana <laughs> Are you are you there? Gabby? I think she cannot hear us, but uh, I will talk maybe on behalf of her. Thank you very much, guys. It was a very nice uh, topic, very distinguished two papers, uh, two talks. And I, I want to thank all the panelists too. It was a vibrant uh, discussion. I think as young, young surgeons, we are more open-minded to discuss more controversies in bariatric surgery. And our next journal club will be hosted by uh, Daniel, Daniel Moritz, Fashion Rye, our friend from Austria. And uh, also these sessions are recorded in IFSO Virtual Academy uh, webpage. So everybody who missed this uh, journal club can reach from that website. And we are continue to do these journal clubs every month in the first week of every Friday from now on. And I wish that we have more participants from everywhere in the world so we can discuss uh, with our seniors and with everybody in the bariatric community about these controversial subjects and research opportunities. Thank you very much for joining us and for making this a uh, very huge uh, scientific panel. Thank you, guys. See you soon in the next Journal Club. Gabby, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.